as I thought about the presentation today and I thought about what do you say to 300 different speakers all on the same topic and say something innovative and exciting, I started to think about talking about the journey that we've been on. Uh, one of the things that I'm really excited about this morning is that we haven't fixated on field of view and on device resolutions. We're talking about real use cases and real applications. So I wanted to broaden our conversation a little bit to not just talk about augmented reality, but talk about wearables in general. Because these devices are essentially wearable devices. Well, let's just say they aspire to be wearable devices. If you tried any of the recent devices on lately, wearability is something that we'll talk about that's a big factor. But if we look back at where we started with technology, not quite all the way back to the 80s when we were bolting backpacks of, of PC rigs, but, but true wearable devices. In 2008, 2010, we started to put sensors in rubber bands and put them on, and they weren't real obtrusive. They didn't you know, violate any social mores. Uh, for us, in the head-worn space, uh, Recon Instruments is part of Intel now, their first device came out in 2008. It was a ski goggle for a couple of reasons. One, you had the real estate. This is the one place that you can wear a big bulky goggle with an augmented reality screen in it and not look out of place, is up on the mountain. Coincidentally, they happened to be an hour from Whistler, so they had a captive audience as well. Wasn't a bad thing. Intel got into the game about three years ago officially with our, with our new devices group. And we started off on a, on a different journey than we usually do. And in that journey, we started to look at wearables not just as technology. In fact, in many cases, technology was second. And we started to look at these devices as consumer goods. And in those consumer goods, we started to look at brands and fashion and what we could do. And so this is a great example of the Mika bracelet that we built. It was a smart bracelet, not a smart watch. It wasn't designed to resemble a watch. It was designed with a fashion house in New York City, specifically fashion first. It was designed with a couple of features that you wouldn't normally think about. With smart watches, smart bands, activity trackers, all the displays are on the top. We're all used to looking at this. This was a fashion piece. You'll notice the screen here was on the bottom. So that you glance at the screen very subtly in company and you don't have a big light lighting up while you're out with your friends, while you're in a meeting, what have you. It was a really good experiment in looking at demographics and thinking about use cases and how things, people were doing things in a different way. And, and so what we learned was that function matters, that fashion matters, that design matters. And so we've gotten into the 3.0. With 3.0, I say we take, we're taking things off the wrist because this was an easy form factor. It can be a little bulky. Uh, you get a really great biometrics relative to other places on your body. Not, not, the, not the best for everything, but from a common, common point, it's very positive. Um, the form factors are relatively well known. Uh, you can get bulk and heft. We started to move into head-worn devices. As you move into head-worn devices and you approach it with this philosophy of design first, you start to notice that there's two vectors going on in the industry right now in head-worn devices. And, and they're at opposing forces. And one is capability. And for the next day and a half, you'll hear all about capabilities. You'll see demos outside. In fact, Robert came up with his HoloLens on. One of the things I say about AR and about this segment is if you're not actually wearing the products in public, how ready for prime time is it really? So Robert broke that moray. He came up in a HoloLens. He's the first one I've seen, or maybe the second, besides Alex, to come up and actually start presenting in that device. But as you look at design, you start to look at, uh, somebody said it earlier this morning, you remove everything you can remove. And when there's nothing left to remove, now you've got a good design. So the screen you see here is a device that we recently launched late last year called the Oakley Radar Pace. Um, we were working very, very closely with Oakley with their design team and their engineering team. And we had a big brainstorming session about all the things you could possibly put on someone's head. Screens and sensors and all these things. And in that first meeting, the head of their design put his hand up and he put the radar frame on the table and he said, but it's got to fit into this. So what do you put in this? 
So what we built was what I still call an augmented reality device. There's no screen. It's full audio. It has two earbuds that you put in. It's an intelligent system. It uses natural language processing, and it's a dual initiative system. By that, I mean you can speak to the device, and the device can speak to you. And it holds context in your conversation. So as you speak to this device and ask it about your performance, or it gives you a piece of data about how you're performing, and you ask whether that's good or not, or is that better, or how am I doing now, it completely understands that. So we've broken down the human interface to this and given it to people that really don't care. Discussion earlier, make technology invisible. Take it away. These people who use this device, they're not trying to create holograms. They're not trying to invent the world. They want to be better athletes. They want to perform at a higher level. They want to run and cycle better, and they want somebody to help them. And the more you can interpret their performance, the more you can make them a better athlete, the more successful this product achieved its goal. But they're also not willing to compromise their self-image. They want to look the way they look all the time. They want a brand that they are proud to wear that embodies their personal image. This is, a, I think, a very, very relevant point. John talked about his early days of TED. And I heard a lot this morning about technology, and I even heard some about entertainment. I've heard very little about design. This is going to be a critical element for us as we look at the adoption curves of augmented reality devices in general. Everybody in the last 18 to 24 months, Christine was ahead of everybody, but most everybody has run to the enterprise. Why? Well, because you saw the backlash of Google. We all know what a glass hole is. People didn't wear these devices in public because of the social backlash of Google Glass. I would actually hazard a guess that if you wore glass out now and anybody had seen a HoloLens, they would think it's pretty sleek and sexy and nobody would give you a second look. But at the time, we were going from zero to this wearable computer strapped on your head. Now we've gone to two-pound headbands. But in the long run, we know the consumer demand and the consumer market is going to far outpace the potential for enterprise. There are a finite number of jobs on the planet. And many of those jobs are being optimized, and many of them are being automated. And so our ability to capture that market is a fixed target. But humans keep reproducing, and technology keeps spreading. And so no one's confused about what the real long-term goal is in this. But I'll say we're doing a disservice to ourselves in one respect, in that we're not really solving real problems. Or when we're solving real problems, we're not giving ourselves credit. I think one of the craziest debates to happen last year was whether Pokemon Go was augmented reality or not. You know what the 40 million billion people that downloaded that app, none of them care. The 300 people in this room, probably a few people on the floor downstairs and a few hundred people in the Bay Area, they're the only ones that care about that debate. Consumers don't care. You hold up your phone and a Pokemon appears and I get to catch it, and if I catch more than my friend, I win. Pure gamification, nobody actually cared. In fact, no, augmented reality doesn't even show up in that application. As we look at the enterprise, we're not integrating into the operational sides of the businesses that can really benefit from these. We're selling to the geeks inside with titles called advanced pathfinding or technology leadership, and I'm not trying to denigrate anybody with one of those titles. Innovation is critical for our industry. But if we've always fixated on what's coming out 12 months from now, FCC certification you know, pending, then we're not actually worried about what we're solving today. I talked about the balance capability and wearability. I seriously think we're going in the wrong direction. From a tool standpoint, from a product standpoint, I think we need to take a step back and say, what problem are we really solving? If the problem is, I really don't like the world I'm in, go put a VR set of goggles on. Nobody cares what you look like in a VR set of goggles, because you can't see people around you, and you can't see their reaction to you. 
And mostly you're putting up the Vive outside in tracking system so you probably don't get out of your living room anyway. When you put on AR, now all of a sudden you're part of the world and now you're actually getting social feedback. So we need to think about that. But even in the enterprise, where bulky is okay, we can get away with more heft, we can get away with more mass, we still have to deal with things like, how does the worker feel at the end of the day? Does the device even work all day? Or do I, am I back to the backpack of batteries again? When we built the radar pace, one of the targets we had was that the longest we thought anybody would exercise was six hours in a stretch in one instance. So the battery had to go six hours in that device. Doesn't do us any good if it quits halfway through and somehow you gotta go find a charging port or you know, plug a juice pack into it. So I, what I'm talking about here is fixated on real practical solutions for today's problems. We saw a, real, a ton of great examples, most of which I hadn't heard of before this morning, which tells me I'm either not doing enough research, which given how much research I do, I'm having a hard time believing, or they're still fairly niche and we need to go in and help and reach in and pull those things out. And as, a, as an industry, everyone in here and everyone in the hallway and the other studios, our livelihoods are all dependent on the success of this. Most of us are not in a, I'll just sit it out and see what happens over the next four or five years. Maybe you've already got tenure and you know, experiments and papers will get you through, but I work for a corporate uh, entity that has very short patience like most companies do. So they want to see what we're doing to solve real problems. So let me go back a second. When we acquired Recon, I got a product called the Recon Jet. And the Recon Jet was another consumer product. It was developed roughly around 2012. Targeted at cyclists and runners. Everyone likes cyclists and runners because they seem very aggressive. They seem very concerned with their performance. They're data driven. And so they built a very ruggedized platform. It's waterproof, it's built for action sports, you can tear it apart, it's got multiple lenses. Never ever conceived of it being anything but what they designed it for. And the minute we integrated them, the folks and the products into Intel, my phone started ringing from all of the corporate customers that we sold other products to, who would ask me about this and tell me I'm using fill in the glass. I'm doing pilots on jet. I'm doing pilots with other vendors. Uh, I'm doing pilots with glass. Tell me about this product and what can you do? And what we found was that building this product, designing the product the way we did for athletes, for comfort, for durability, for wearability, immediately transformed into a worker experience. So we're starting to eat our own dog food on this. Everybody's running pilots. We're running pilots. Uh, we'll be publicizing these, but I'll share a little bit about what we're working on. We're running a pilot right now in our distribution center, and we're putting these on our workers who do picking and packing for our parts. The first day we put it on, an, on a worker, we had a 15% improvement in their productivity. Just simply putting it on so that they don't have to keep looking down at, a, at an RF scanner and looking up at what they're looking at. The peak that we've measured is about 45%. Now, I don't think that'll persist. I think maybe he was feeling pretty good and we got cameras rolling and it's probably way more attention than anybody in that warehouse has gotten in a long time. But that's okay because what we're proving out is that these things do have real value. Uh, the other one that we're doing is really interesting and, and something that I think was being talked about this morning with, with SMEs, with, with subject matter experts, is we're doing some things in our factory to automate processes. So today we have multi-million dollar tools that require two workers for every step. Because if you screw up one, that step, it's millions and millions of dollars of potential inventory that you've destroyed. So we have a person to do it and a person to verify that it's okay to do it. And we're automating that process. And what we're doing is we're having that person wear AR glasses with a camera, and we're having a subject matter expert somewhere in a console that can now work with multiple of these workers on the tools. They still can't pull the lever or push the button until they get the thumbs up from their, from their partner, but we don't have to have them both standing in front of the tool. And I think from an automation and from a workforce management perspective, that's fantastic. But it also starts to say things about how we're gonna manage our workforce going forward. 
because we have an aging population of experienced people and we have a rising population of inexperienced people. And when I talk to companies that are doing these pilots, that's one of the key drivers. It's great to talk about bottom line advantages. What they're really worried about uh, is those experienced people with 30 plus years, 40 plus years of experience retiring and going away and being filled up with workers who have no practical knowledge of their environment and having to go have, let's say, a rebuilding year. I think as we talk about the human factors, these are going to be more and more relevant from both segments. How consumers feel about what they're putting on their heads and the experiences that they really value, and how workers feel about how you're treating them and what their potential is for improvement, what their potential is for management. These types of solutions can completely flip your entire workforce management philosophy. Today, you send your, heart, your best worker, your most experienced person, to go do the hardest job you have. And you kill that person until they're burned out. And if you're a field worker, if you're climbing poles, fixing uh, turbines, or if you're an energy worker and you're out there working on the grid, your viability of work in doing that starts to go down dramat dramatically as you age. What if we flip that? What if by being the best worker in the workforce means you get to stay back at the central office with a hot cup of coffee and a cushy chair and you get to manage everybody else in the field and tell them what they're doing wrong? We now create a reward system that actually benefits you and actually prolongs your workforce time. So I'm not going to go into all of the details. Nine minutes isn't a whole lot of time to talk about this. I'm just scratching the surface. But I think as we start to look into What's really going to be successful? What do we really need to do? We need to think way beyond waveguides and prisms and half-silvered mirrors and field of view. And we need to start thinking about the world that we're selling these into, the social effects, the economic impact, the infrastructures that we're selling it into, and are we really ready? And let's get ready. Because what I would say is even if we had 10-year technology, 10-year ahead technology today, fast forward and make the HoloLens weigh one-tenth of what it weighs today and run 20 times longer, our infrastructure is not geared for it. Our people are not ready for it. And I'm not a big believer in just a build it and they will come. We need to start to educate. We need to get these solutions rolling. And we need to focus on the overall effects of what we're building, not just the tech specs. Thank you.